Hi, Steve here at uh, BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been going through 2 Corinthians, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were in the fourth chapter, uh, uh, about the fourth verse. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. We're in a very important section of 2 Corinthians. In fact, much of the message of both uh, 1st and 2nd uh, Corinthians is centered in the truth of this passage. We've seen the Holy Spirit deal with the carnality at Corinth based upon the love of God and the grace of God, uh, contrasting in the third chapter of 2 Corinthians, the great limitations of law. Uh, though it was glorious, it had serious limitations. It was written in stony tablets. It was a covenant or a ministry of death and, and of condemnation, whereas the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ is a ministry of uh, life and righteousness. Beginning in the fourth chapter then, the Holy Spirit says, Since we've received this ministry, a ministry of liberty, uh, the covenant of, of law was a passing covenant. The covenant of grace is an eternal covenant. Uh, the law was for the unrighteous. Grace is for those who were declared righteous. Uh, we've been made righteous in Christ. Uh, and the declaration of that righteousness is based upon Jesus Christ and nothing more. Since we have a ministry of liberty, the, the grand news, the great news, is we shouldn't become discouraged. We need to recognize the amazing contrast there of that verse. Before the rest of the paragraph, God has given you the greatest message that you could possibly imagine, a message of liberty, a message of grace, a message of love. Don't be discouraged. And, of course, we ask, have to ask, well, how in the world could we be discouraged? You know, when we have the greatest message that uh, anyone ever had the opportunity to carry, why should I become discouraged? And we'll soon, see, we'll, we'll, we'll soon see, I believe, in the chapter that we're troubled on every side and uh, perplexed and uh, so forth. You know, folks, look, why, if I have the most fantastic message of, of free, justified freely by His grace, should I ever think about becoming discouraged? Uh, I think that point is going to be, become clear in a moment. The solution to discouragement is one of two possibilities. One possibility is, is, that, uh, is to just, I just revert back to shameful tactics uh, like we did in our former life, way of life. And, and I say it again, folks, as boldly as I know how to say it, that's, that's primarily what you hear today. You, you, can't, you can't hardly hurt, turn on a radio station or a TV a channel or surf YouTube or whatever without hearing uh, something you know, other than the gospel. And I declare with all of the love, folks, that I know how to muster, that it is virtually impossible to turn on any main media or sub-media channel. I, I think just about any, anywhere in the world and hear the gospel as we were given it. Now, that's a bold claim, and I understand that that's a bold claim. But... I hope that by the time we get to the end of this video, you can somehow see, well, I, sh I should say, since if, you, if you've studied with us through First and Second Corinthians, you should by, very much by now understand that uh, Christ is the focus, not self, or law. And when I say, uh, when, I, when I talk about this, this shameful the dishonesty and and, you know, the things that we've renounced, the hidden things of dishonesty, you know, which the Greek says we refuse to resort to shameful tactics. That's, folks, is what the Pharisees did. All right, the, the great conflict that existed with uh, Christ in His earthly ministry was not with liberals. His great conflict was with those who professed to be the fundamentalists. That's what the word Pharisee means, fundamentalist. 
His great conflict was with those who said that they were upholding the Word of God, that they were the spokesman for God, that they were the oracle of God, that they were the storehouse of His information. You know, if, if you and I had lived 2,000 years ago and we wanted to worship the one true God, we'd have gone to Jerusalem. If we had a question that we didn't know that we wanted to ask, we would have gone to Jerusalem. We would not have gone to Galilee. Christ was in Galilee. And this conflict was with those who openly professed to be God's spokesmen. You know, I'm certain that they would have died, you know, for their testimony. And yet Christ said, You're of your father the devil, and his deeds you will do. It should not surprise you that Satan surely knows how this, the game is played. You know, witnessing today is, is to tell, tell of your experiences rather than to proclaim Jesus Christ. Which is not very popular. If you, if you don't want to become discouraged in this great ministry of liberty which is yours in Christ, then you can resort to shameful tactics and you can handle the Word of God deceitfully. You know, an evangelist today, folks, it doesn't, he doesn't need to really just do a whole lot of studying. Okay? He only has one message to proclaim. You know, a modern evangelist today doesn't need to study the Bible. Obviously, he can pour in any meanings to verses of Scripture that he wants. And, and, and I realize that is a devastating charge, but I believe it needs to be said. We're surrounded by shameful tactics in the Word of God and handling the Word of God deceitfully. The verse says we don't do that. And right away says somebody says, Oh, well, Steve, you know, are you saying that you never do that? Of course, I do. This is why I pray that the Holy Spirit filter out all of the garbage and all of the foolishness. But it doesn't change the fact that, that this, is the, this is the situation that we're looking at. I do not believe that you could faithfully, folks, proclaim this book and be supported by any missionary organization in existence today. I, I don't know of a mission board that would take you. You know, not if you stick faithfully to this book. That's a terrible charge. You know, there, there's hardly a week goes by that some Christian isn't asked to leave one of the modern missionary boards because of the way that he teaches the Word. You know, you'd think he'd be asked to leave because, you know, he handled money funny or something like that, but it's, it's because of the way that he taught the Word. Modern Christianity does not lend itself to serious examination of this book. Folks, it just doesn't. There, there are blessed few who profess to be Christians who really, really want to study this book. You know, they know what they believe because they heard somebody say it or they, or they sung it in a song, or, but they didn't dig it out of this book. What is the solution for shameful tactics in handling the Word of God deceitfully? An open manifestation of the truth, just what we're reading in our study. That's what commends ourselves to every man's conscience. I, I've heard it said, you know, you commend yourself to every man's conscience by how you handle money, by how you drive your car, by how you treat your wife and your kids. Now, now there may be down the line someplace a shred of truth in that, folks, but the context of the, this verse says, that the way you commend yourself to every man's conscience is the open manifestation, the declaration of this book of truth. Not how you live. And, and I am not at all minimizing your responsibility to live submitted and yielded to God. Not at all. But we might want to talk about what that submission, what that yieldness to God is really talking about. What is it that we yield to God? What is the solution for shameful tactics in handling the Word of God deceitfully? An open manifestation of, of the truth. The way that you commend yourself to every man's conscience according to the Holy Spirit is how you openly declare the truth of this book. You know, the other answer for discouragement is verse 3. 
you know, in our understanding that a lot of people aren't going to hear the message. That's why we get discouraged. The grand news that you have to, to declare is permanently hidden from those who are being ruined. There's nothing that you can do about that. Those who are perishing. Actually, the literal translation is those who are being ruined. Therefore, you know, you shouldn't be discouraged when you proclaim this grand message. Those who belong to God will hear. Those who do not cannot hear. So it is a foolish, foolish thing to resort to shameful tactics to try to get somebody to understand who can't understand. The reason we don't get discouraged is not because we resort to shameful tactics, which obscure the discouragement. And back in 1 Corinthians, we were told that if we are faithfully proclaiming the Word of God, we'll be despised, we'll be cast off, we'll be considered the filth of the religious system. But who wants that? Who wants that? You know, surely the, the modern day proclamation of the Bible is not considered the filth of the religious system. But the Holy Spirit says it will be if it's faithfully proclaimed. It will not be popular. Now, I suppose one thing I've said almost more than anything else that I've been criticized before, I'll repeat it again because I believe it, absolutely believe it completely, that any popular movement is not of the Holy Spirit. Unless I don't know how to read this book. It won't be popular. I think what we have to understand is that the grand news that we have to, to declare is absolutely concealed to those who are perishing, those who are being ruined. They're not going to hear anyway. And the grand news that we have to, to declare is to God's family, and they will hear. The rest won't. And the fourth verse tells us that the God of this age has blinded their minds, the minds of those who are unbelieving, lest the light of the, of the gospel of the glory of Christ dawn on them. That's what we proclaim. Not, you know, I have the gospel, I'm going to preach the gospel to you, you can go to heaven if you want to. Not one verse in the whole Bible says that. Not, one, not a single verse says that. But almost every Christian thinks that. Every Christian thinks that that's the gospel. You know, if you wanted to go to heaven, you could. All you got to do is just do something. Repent, believe, be baptized something, and then you can go to heaven. And there isn't a verse anywhere in this book that says that, not even one. For somebody to stand up and say, that's the, that's the gospel, is either deceitful, ignorant, or shameful. The glory of the gospel of Christ is that He died in your place so you will not die. The gospel is not He died in your place so you don't need to die if you decide that you don't want to die. That's not the gospel. The grand news, folks, is He died in your place, so you will not die. And that's hidden to those who are being ruined, but it's not hidden to God's children. Okay? It's not. It, it can't be. And the grand news that we have to, that we, to carry, to declare, the super news is Jesus Christ died in your place, so you're not going to die. You're going to be in glory, and somebody always says to me, well, but what if? Well, what if there's somebody in whose place Christ didn't die? Well, that person won't hear. And I hate to belabor a point, folks, but that's just the reality of it. Because this grand news is hidden to him. I can't unveil it. I mean, good land. If his mind has been blinded, and that's an aorist. I pointed out that's an aorist tense. If he can't hear, I can't make him see. I can't make him hear. But God's children will. They will. And so we come to verse 5. Because of this, we herald not ourselves. We, we preach not ourselves. We do not preach ourselves. We preach nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified, not our works, not law, in verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, and now we need to decide what the treasure is, folks. Well, is that our personality? Maybe, maybe, maybe some would pick that. I, I certainly wouldn't. So now we all just pick our meaning. And folks, there's a way that we study the Bible. It's not let's draw straws on what the thing means. I, I think we come to a verse expecting the context to explain it. You know... Uh, I remind you again, the Holy Spirit 
said to Timothy, Take heed to doctrine, uh, for by so doing thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. But here we've got Timothy already redeemed. And so I have to come to the conclusion he's redeemed. So salvation there must mean something else. And I have to look at the verses carefully. You know, and the, the meaning is usually floating in plain sight. Seems to me it's very dangerous, folks, to depart from the context. Preaching ourselves must have to do with deceitful things or things of shame compared to the manifestation of the truth. And I think that makes sense. You know, I have the option of proclaiming what I, I can do or what Christ has done. Not, not lay another foundation other than Jesus Christ, one centered around man. Uh, I think that's another gospel. And I tell you folks with all my heart, I have no desire but to proclaim what this book says with all of my heart. You know, maybe it sounds unloving. I, I love you folks dearly. I don't, but I don't care whether you subscribe to this channel or not. I really don't. I don't want to be tempted by, by fame or, or fortune or, or funds. My, my, my heart breaks, folks, for the true believer of the Lord Jesus Christ who's been harmed, even ruined by the human philosophy, philosophy and, and traditions of men, everything that's crept into Christianity right from the very start. My heart breaks for every Christian who's been harmed by that legal system that is based on human merit, that's driven a wedge between them and the liberty that they have in Christ, the freedom, the joy, the peace, the under, the, that passes all understanding, just the, the rest, the, the freedom from guilt. These are the things that Christians need to hear. We don't need to use deceit to get this message out. The Holy Spirit didn't use He didn't use deceit when He covered a million and a half square miles. Didn't ha He didn't have a jet. He didn't have you know He didn't have radio, TV. Didn't have a printing press. Holy Spirit got it done. We preach not ourselves, and, and it seems to me that my choice is either to preach what I think or to come to this book in meekness. You know I I don't, I don't want to sit here and preach myself. I don't want to waste your your time. You, you precious people's time. I don't want to waste your time with, with my own personal convictions about things. That's, that's hard to do when you're, when, you're, when you're a minister, when you're preaching, when you're teaching. It's, it's hard to kind of leave your own presuppositions out of everything. I mean, I'm going to tell you what I believe, but it's... I, I can tell you it's a tremendous temptation, I think, to tell for a, a pastor to tell people how to live, how to make you all feel good, tell you the things that I think are bad for you. You know, that is not the message that I was given to preach. I don't see a meek, humble presentation of, of the Word of God that's despised and rejected by the masses. I don't see that today, you know. And, you know, I see witnesses of self to self, self ministering to self. Okay, you know, it's not about Christ. I, I see this book being not, you know, uh, you know what it says, but what people think it ought to say. I see heaven, the uh, the attainment of something that you've done by your own work, your own surrender, your own yieldness, your own intelligence, your own acceptance. Not by not not by what Christ did. And. Therein, I mean, in that much, you've just blown the whole thing. You've missed, you've stumbled over the stumbling block. It's the glory of the, it's the gospel of the glory of Christ. That, that's the only thing that I have to proclaim. It's, it's a finished transaction. He came to seek and to save the lost. He declared on the cross it's finished. And I think it's, that's fantastic. I think it's fantastic, folks. He's not only the author, but the finisher of my faith. He's, he's the completer. The... I didn't author it, nor, did I, nor will I finish it. Christ did that. He's the one who died in my place so that I'm declared to be righteous. The law was not made for a righteous man, so the law has nothing to do with me or you. Where no law is, there's no transgression. So I can't commit any transgression. Therefore, I, 
I cannot stand in any way condemned before God. And that, folks, is fantastic news. You tell, you, you tell people that, okay, the pastor out here stands up and before his congregation and he preaches that, and these folks may not want to go home. Then again, they may throw him out the door. I, what I hear proclaimed is something that tries to put me under conviction or condemnation so that I'll witness more, sing more, pray more, I don't know, whatever, whatever. You know? Read my Bible more. Study more. I'm telling you to study more. Folks, we don't preach ourselves. And I believe preaching ourselves is simply a way of encompassing the very tactics that the Holy Spirit opposes in this chapter. And the converse of that is that we preach the gospel of the glory of Christ and we proclaim ourselves servants because of Jesus for you, says the text. We should be the slaves of others who belong to the Lord. Well, in fact, we are. Folks, we don't live under law but grace. I believe any physical rep representation of biblical truth will lead you from the truth, not to it. It'll lead you from it. You know, we can become so involved in the, in the physical washing of, of one another's feet that we forget the meaning behind it all. And we're, we, we are to do it without shame, without hypocrisy, without deceit, that the Word might speak to us openly. We're, we're not to come to this, this table, His Word, not, that's not this channel. We're not to come to His Word in an ungodly manner. This is where God feeds us, and this is where God speaks to us. You know, it was our Lord Jesus Christ who showed Himself to be a servant of others. But we need to understand what it means to serve. It was God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, folks. There was, there was darkness and, and God commanded, let there be light and there was light. God, God is light and, and in Him is no darkness at all. From Genesis to Revelation, darkness is always connected with sin and with Satan who did the blinding of verse 4, but God has shined in our hearts. And the, the same God who said, let there be light has shined in our hearts. The grand news, the great news, the, the gospel is that you, you and I who were fallen creatures by Adam's sin, God commanded light to shine out of darkness. It's God who lightens the heart. I don't have to worry about it. The function and the purpose and, and, and the drive of the proclamation of this book is simply to get the proclamation out. The Holy Spirit has to do the lighting. It's, it's God who commands the light. You know. Well, how did you come to believe? Well, I studied it and I studied it and I studied it. And finally, I convinced myself that I was a sinner. And then I accepted Christ one night. You know, hallelujah, now I'm going to heaven. And where was God in all that? Well, He was sitting in His rocking chair, smoking His pipe, hoping that I'd do this or that. or whatever. That's not true. Folks, you were darkened by sin and it was God Almighty who commanded the light to shine in the darkness. That's the truth we're proclaiming. God did it. God did it. You didn't. You didn't. The Scriptures declare that when we do get to glory, the great song that we're going to sing is the deliverance of ourselves by God. God's deliverance of us. Much of so-called Christianity that I hear proclaimed today you know, apparently when we get into glory, you know, we're going to sing, oh, I'm glad, how glad I am I accepted Christ. I'm glad I repented, you know. I'm glad I did this or whatever. 
Folks, my Bible declares that when I get to glory, I'm going to sing that God did it all. God did it all. So I am thrilled to be able to declare that God loves you, that He chose you, that He redeems you, that in, and by doing so, in dying in your place, He made an eternal covenant with you that He'll never break. He'll never break that covenant. He'll never leave you and He'll never forsake you. As sure as day follows night, folks, you will be with Him in glory and what about the one who belongs to Satan? He can't hear. His mind's been blinded. The proclamation, folks, is not for that one. Okay? It is not. It's for you. In fact, Scripture has very little to say about the non-believer except for judgment. And so we see that we're cast down but unconquered. Do we have this treasure in earth, earthen vessels? I believe that's what we have. That tr I, and I'm just going to throw this out there. I believe that it is our estimation of God's glory, His value, His worth. It's kind of like, just think of it quite simply as what you think something is worth. Okay? This, you know, anything. Okay? When we're talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, what we, I think, are so blessed with and what we so guard so zealously and cherish so much you know besides the indwelling of the holy spirit the conviction of the holy spirit the comfort that the holy spirit gives us is just knowing knowing who he is and what he's done there's so many christians today who just don't know what he's done they have the whole wrong idea about what Christ, who Jesus was, and what He did. That's what they need to hear. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into Your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunity that You give us to feast upon Your Word together filter out all of that which is foolish but seal to our hearts only that which is truth for it's in christ's name i pray amen